Good Wednesday evening to you. We welcome you guys back for another midweek class discussion. We are excited to have you here with us and uh, really thankful for so many that are tuning in. And you know, that's not a minor point just to start off uh, saying mm -hmm. um, we never take for granted that uh, there are those that tune in faithfully and watch and we appreciate that. We hope that um, the time spent in discussion of God's Word is profitable and informative and is helping them to grow. Uh, that's our intent in everything that we do here. at the. Not program. only are the folks in Little Rock tuning in and watching with our Wednesday night and Sunday night offerings, but we have people around the state, yep. even in different places around the country. We're excited about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that technology, although we kind of slid into this um, Kicking and screaming backwards because of COVID. There's a pejorative that goes in front of that. But anyway, t technically, um, <laughs> you know, COVID kind of forced our hand on that. But as we have checked and read here in Romans, uh, we know that all things do work for the good of those that yeah, love him. While we're on this, we'll eventually get to the matter at hand in just a <laughs> second. I had uh, a, an esteemed brother that asked me a few months ago, he said, well, when COVID starts to wind down, which mm -hmm. it's starting to wind down, mm -hmm. he said, are you guys going to quit broadcasting things? Yeah. And I said, no, we're going to keep doing it. Genius he said, well, if, if you stop broadcasting it, it will force people to come back. I said, mm -hmm. one, no, it won't. Number two, so what? And number three, you're looking at this the wrong way. Yeah. Isaiah 55, as the word of the Lord goes, goes out, out, it will not return unto him empty, Boy. but will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. Absolutely. So all of you are living proof that as the word goes out, it's doing things to us, it's changing us. It's taking root in our heart. It's producing a good crop, as Jesus says. We're excited about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there are some churches, I've heard some of them, you know, no, we're not going to do that. You can come here. And, you know, decades ago, years yeah. ago, I was kind of of that ilk. But, you know, you got to take advantage of these opportunities. Oh, I, I think so. It, it, it is fortuitous that, um, you know, we can take advantage of the technology to reach more and more people. And that's what it's all about. It At is. Pinnacle, we're all about living and sharing uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if that sharing takes the form that's of uh, technology, so be it. The main thing is that more people learn about Jesus. And that's what we're um, about this evening as we continue our study in the book of Romans. Tonight we'll be in uh, Romans chapter 13, kind of as we wind up. Uh, we've been in Romans 13 for the past uh, week, and, and Paul is trying to make some summary statements mm -hmm. in chapter 13, talking about uh, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. We talked about that last time. And government and authorities and such. You and did a lot. very good job last week of tying the last few verses into the rest of it because, because you're right. It all is kind mm -hmm. of a unit. It goes together. Part of being a good citizen is putting into practice some of these traits and characteristics that Paul is enumerating here. Absolutely. But as there are so many parallels between these words in verses yep. 11 through 14 yep. and the times in which we're finding ourselves living, it behooves us to spend a little more time on that. So, so, so that's where we're going to be tonight. Romans chapter 13, um, beginning with verse number 11, and we find these words. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Mm. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. First of all, <laughs> the time has come. The hour has come. What does that mean exactly? Well, What's I was going to ask you, Chuck, what time is it? You've got a nice, nifty... I always know what time it is. Who was that cat that had the clock around his neck? Oh, Flava Flav. Flav. Yeah, you need giant one of those. Clock. Yeah, I should have worn, worn the big watch. That would have been a good look for watch. you. The time has come means, look, we've fooled around enough. We've wasted time. We frittered away the day. We did this. We did that. Now, it's time to get serious Yeah. Here. I think that's exactly right. Uh, Paul is using uh, uh, colloqui colloquialism mm -hmm. of the day, a nomenclature that, you know, my mother used to say that. It's high time for you to get, yeah. well, we understood <laughs> what that meant. I bet your mom has said Quit that. Quit fooling around. It's high time. It's serious. Yeah. That's right. And that's... so Paul is making that summary statement. Now, you got to remember where we were. He's coming out of um, the bulk of chapter 13. 
and he says in verse number 10 that love mm. uh, works no ill to its neighbors. He's talking about the law. All the law is fulfilled in this. And that, my mom was a school teacher, and is a coordinating conjunction. And so what's coming here is tied to what came before. And the point that Paul is making is that if you're really serious about fulfilling the law, if you're really serious about getting on with the life of living the Christian, here's the second part of that, as you said. Look at this first phrase in verse 11. Besides this, mm. you know the time. Mm. Okay, there was a great uh, opening act for the purple one, Prince, <laughs> if you remember Purple Rain, and it was Morris Day. And the time. And the time. And they had one cat, I forget if it was Jesse or if it was Jerome. Jerome. But they would come out, out there with a the the mirror, mirror yeah. and he'd make sure that his look was good. And then yeah. Morris would say, what time, what time is, is it? it? What time? Well, what time is it? What time is it? It's time to wake up. Okay, yeah. it's time to, to stop wasting time. Paul enjoys this phrase because he'll use it elsewhere in his writings in yes, 1 Corinthians 13. Yes. yes. Okay. It's time for you to stop wake, acting wake the fool. Out of your sleep. It's time to stop acting the child. It's time for you to become a man. When yeah. I became a man, I put childish ways behind me and I started thinking as God would have me to think. So what it means, the time, you know what time it is. The hours come from you to wake up from your sleep. It's time for you to start putting first things first, to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. There might be someone out there today. This sounds a little going into from first gear to fourth gear, a little Jimmy Allen-ish, but right. let's just say it. Get right to there it. There are some of you that are watching who have never obeyed the gospel. There are some of you that have never been baptized. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you don't believe in that, but you haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. Or you, you know, well, well, once I get to another stage in my life, mm -hmm. then I'm going to do this. But first I got to do this and I got to do that. Paul's saying to it's you, time. it's time. It's time to stop fooling around. It's time to obey the gospel. The time is now. Mm -hmm. Jesus would say that. Look around you. The fields are ripe unto harvest. And, and you know, the, the time is fleeting. Okay. Yeah. Jesus recognizes that while it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Yeah, same look, idea. And, and I think that same juxtaposition, um, poetically, uh, phonetically, if you will, he's making some comparison contrast is what I'm trying to say. And so he does use that. The night is far spent. It is now day. So you can see that visually that, that you know, you've, you've slumbered, you've messed around, it's night, but now it's day, it's time to wake up. And, and he says, the works of darkness mm. are this, but if we're people of God, let's put on the armor of the light. So he's making some pretty powerful arguments here. And visually, you can almost see the comparison contrast that he's making. The night is gone. The day is at hand. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Mm. We are a day closer to that date with destiny that we have with the Lord, either when we die or when the Lord comes back, whichever yeah. comes first. And think about it, uh, Chuck. I mean, really, and, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Hopefully, in all of our um, uh, video lessons, Bible lessons, we're making this point. None of us know. Mm. Uh, James talks about what is your life but a vapor uh, appears for a little while. And so we're not trying to scare anyone. I don't think that was Paul's tactic here, but just speaking the truth in love, being plain spoken, the time is far spent. And, and, and the time of our salvation, it's, it's closer mm. than it's ever been. Mm. The, the, the Lord may come before we finish this video. If the Lord doesn't come, we're still closer to death than we are to anything else. And so he's making an argument that's based on uh, a rational, sensible um, context mm -hmm. that it's time to start living the life. I would have a difficult time counting uh, the number of instances where I heard a preacher when I was a kid coming up in the church <laughs> giving me the same spiel. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the Lord could come before the end of this lesson. You could die this very night. I remember as a young man, I was aware of that. I had my head on a swivel oh, because yeah. you know, this could be it. 
And think about how the preaching in the church has changed over generations. Absolutely. We got a bunch of folks now, they never think about that. They're not going to die. It's all good. Not God until they're 117. You. And we can't worry about the judgment. We mm. can't worry about our salvation because we got to get the praise team just right. Mm. We got to get their dance steps down. And all of these wonderful innovations are going to save the church from irrelevance. Mm. Yeah. And you see, I'm being facetious and I'm putting it on a little bit thick. Here's the point. Paul's not playing games here. Yeah. A lot of Christians today are playing games. And Paul is basically saying, I think that's wake it. Up. He's, he's trying to give wake them a up. jolt. He's that's trying right. to give them a shake. And all of the arguments that they were making back then in the first century and have been made down through the tunnel of time that possibly we're still making today. Mm. Uh, Paul is saying, okay, be that as it may, I've got an answer for that. But here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. It is now time to put up or to shut up. That's it. Um, if you look there in verse 13, I, I, I like what he says here about let us be, let's be honest. Let's walk honestly. When the Bible talks about walk, obviously it's not talking about ambulating, putting one foot in front of the other. It's talking about how you live. And so Paul is saying, let's live honestly again as in the day. Now, notice a couple of things he says. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a tendency sometimes, John, to romanticize back in the day when the church was perfect. Uh -huh. You know, and, and I think there are a lot of things about the first century church that should be emulated, that should be <laughs> followed. But we're not suggesting that everything that the Christians did in the first century should be. Look at what some of the stuff apparently that they're doing. Mm -hmm. He says, let us then cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. Mm -hmm. Okay, no argument there. But then he starts getting specific. Let us walk properly mm -hmm. as in the daytime, folks are watching you, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and mm -hmm. sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Yeah. I've told this story before, but it bears repeating. I, was, I preached a sermon a couple of decades ago titled uh, Righteousness, Self-Control, and the Judgment to Come. Mm -hmm. Not an original title. If you remember, those were the three main uh, points of Paul's sermon. Verse for verse. I, think. <laughs> I, I find good material. So we're talking about the judgment and talking about things that Christians need to be prepared for to face the judgment. What does Paul just say here? Right here. That salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. We're getting closer mm -hmm. to meeting the Lord. So make sure that you're sober-minded, make sure you're ready. So I had a sister just absolutely lost her mind. Should uh -oh. not surprise you that she's wandered off the reservation. Uh -oh. She's gone full bore into some denomination. But she said to me, I'll never forget these words. She said, well, I had a problem with the sermon. I said, well, mm -hmm. you coming in, I was guessing that you did. What was it? Well, you suggested that there might be some people in the audience yesterday that should be nervous about the judgment. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I didn't suggest, suggest it. I didn't suggest it. I said it. And you just I just have to know him, folks. And he I didn't he say suggest anything. they should be nervous. I said they should be scared to death because they're not living right. Yeah. Well, no, because anyone that's ever believed, they should never. Work. Well, that's really fascinating because Paul just says, for Absolutely. salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Yeah. Time out. He's talking to believers. Yes, he is. Talking to folks that have obeyed the, the gospel. Church. But what have these believers done, Brother Phillips? They've wandered back into a former way of life. Yeah. They're, not, uh, they're, they're not just forsaking the assembly. They're forsaking the assembly to go to orgies and to get drunk and to engage in sexual immorality mm -hmm. and sensual immorality. They're in quarreling. They're in jealousy. They're doing everything they're not supposed to do. And that's what Paul is saying. You better get your face toward, turned toward God mm -hmm. And quit looking at the world because the world's going to swallow you up. It's going to swallow you up. You've got to be ready to meet the Lord. I, I think that's it right there, Chuck. And, and again, we understand that when uh, Paul wrote this letter, he didn't sit down and write chapter 12, verses 1 through, and then chapter 13. Just a free-flowing he, he, letter. He was just writing. And yes. so now it kind of makes sense what he did say there in chapter 12 about not conforming to the world but you're transformed and live like it so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of yes. God. And so he says then, well, well, if that is the case, let's be honest. Let's live mm. the life that we talk about, that we That's sing right. about, that we preach about. 
as in the day, making that word picture again, but in case they did not understand it, let me explain to you what some of the things that you're doing are. And he delineates all of these different vices. He really does. But I think more than that, uh, something that James says um, over in, in his uh, letter, it's not so much that you're doing anything wrong per chance, mm. it could also be the case that you're not doing what's right. To him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So, I, I, uh, yeah. I hear that kind of yeah. coming through that yeah. if we're just complacent, if we're just going along to get along, if we're just conforming to the status quo, maybe what Paul is saying is wake up. It's time to start walking. I, I wish I had the picture of the guy here. It would probably add to it because this guy had this. If you can imagine what Kurt Russell looked like in Tombstone. Oh he got on the hat and his hair's back and he got the big handlebar, big mustache. Mm. Well, there was this cat that preached in the 1800s down in Texas and in the south named Sam Jones. Okay. Sam Jones would go into these churches and he had, John, what he called quitting meetings. Quitting? Quitting <laughs> meetings. And he said, there's some of you that are out there getting drunk, you need uh, to quit it. There's some of you out there gossiping, you need to quit it. There's some of you out there, you know, having a dalliance with your neighbor's wife, you need to quit yeah. it. And on down the line. My favorite story about this, and, and at the end of the in, at the end of the sermon, he would issue an invitation, and some folks would come down and say, "Well, you know, I've been going to the track I'm and gambling. Quitting. I'm quitting it. Mm -hmm. I've been I, I've been you know, wanting to beat my neighbor's head in with a stick, and I, I'm going to quit that." Okay. So some woman comes down, she sits on the front row, and, and uh, Jones goes up to her and says, "Well, sister, what, what what can we do to help you?" She said, "Well, I haven't been doing anything." <laughs> okay. She said, and I'm going to quit it. Quit doing so that. There's, so there's some folks that that's what they're yeah. in need of quitting. They yeah. haven't been doing anything. I think there, so. There are some of these folks, they've been doing some stuff, and they need to quit that too. A absolutely, and that's the obvious fact. I mean, that, that's axiomatic, as they would say. But in spite of that, whatever, you know, rocks your boat, whatever shoe that fits, mm. here's the point. And Paul brings it to, to a head here in his um, last statement. Put ye on... Mm the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And so whatever that vice, whatever that sin, whatever that problem may be, recognize, and that's what his, his point is, the time is, I mean, okay, we all have wandered off the reservation, your yeah. favorite phrase, yeah. but it's time to come on back. I have had several conversations lately with some folks, and one of the big issues of our time is that, you know, well, well this person was born as, yeah. as gay man. She was yeah. born as a lesbian. Yeah. She was born this way. You know, yeah. Lady Gaga had a song, Born This Way. Okay, that's the big thing. <laughs> I've heard some people say, well, they're going to find a gene one day encoded mm -hmm. in our DNA, and we were born that way. The well, he, gene. here's the thing. I don't think that that's ever going to be found. I no. think that's up there with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. As far as we keep looking, <laughs> we haven't found E.T. yet. We keep looking, but it, we, it, so far it's us. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. Bill Oliver said something profound. And if you think it's easy for Bill Oliver to say something profound, you haven't hung out with Bill Oliver very much. Obviously. But we were talking about this very thing, about, well, what, what if a person's born that way? And he said something I thought that was really striking. He said, so what if someone is born that way and they have an, uh, a, a, an inclination toward this or they have uh, an appetite for that? You know, I, look, there are a lot of people, they have an ap appetite for alcohol. I'd like to get drunk. I'd like to get high. I'd like to do this. Uh, some people want to gamble, they, whatever it is, okay? The fact that you might have proclivities or tendencies in some area, that's not really either here or there. And here's why. Notice what this says. Yes. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can all recognize that that's the truth, right? Now look at what he says next. Make no provision, provision. for the flesh to gratify its desires. Yeah. In other words, it's almost as if God doesn't really care what your desires yeah. are. He doesn't care, John Phillips, that you want to go out there and, and, and have a moonshine still in your backyard. Yeah. He doesn't care that you like the taste of it. He doesn't care that you don't make provision for the flesh period end of sentence yeah. now if you're saying that god what doesn't want me to do everything that i want to do yeah that's right he doesn't yeah. he wants you to pursue a life of righteousness I, th I think that's part of the putting on and and notice if you will chuck 
and, and maybe I'm overthinking it here, I don't think I am. Paul is very deliberate in his speech pattern and what he says. He says, you've got to make a choice, number one. Number two, you've got to be deliberate about living the Christian life. You've got to walk honestly. Mm, mm. Put ye on. You made a choice to put on That's right. some clothes today. You made a choice to, to, to come to this place at this time, at this hour. And same thing about living the Christian life. We've got to make that choice that we're going to put on Christ and everything that goes along with that. And, and it's interesting to me that he says, and make not provisions. <laughs> you ever been camping? I have. Did you just go out there and decide, you know, well, we'll just camp and the, see what the happens. The stuff you got to take with you to you camp, it's provisions. easier to stay at home. Yeah. And so you yeah. got to be deliberate about taking yeah. the right things. I need and, this and I need that. Need and I need this, this and that. This is the same thing that he's saying as yes. Christians, we need to make provision. If we've made the choice to, to walk right. in Christ, to put on Christ, then we've also got to be deliberate about some things that may be our slant, our proclivities, I think is what mm. the word you use, that we're going to kind of resist that temptation and not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And so it's a pretty, pretty lucid argument that he's making. He says, look, you don't make any provision <clears throat> for the flesh to gratify its desires. Yeah. Your verbiage says what at the end um, of chapter 13? Fulfill the lust to thereof. To fulfill the lust thereof. That's, Very Shakespearean. That is pretty good, okay? <laughs> the lust thereof, okay? God doesn't want you to fulfill yeah. your lusts thereof. One of the dumbest things that's been said in the history of the church's existence has been probably said more in the last 40 years mm -hmm. than in its previous uh, 1900 years. Mm -hmm. And that is, God just wants me to be happy. There you go. Well, if by happy you mean he wants you to be holy, yes. Mm -hmm. He wants you to live according to his purpose, yes. He wants you to walk in the narrow way, absolutely. If by being happy, mm -hmm. You're saying that God wants you to do every single thing that you want to do. No, he doesn't. He never has. That's of human invention. And I would suggest that, that whatever dullard came up with that phrase the very first time it was said, Satan was whispering in his ear or in her ear saying, God's trying to steal your fun. The, the, oh, wait, there's no, God a, a you happy. word, uh, you know, the word hedonism. Yeah. Uh, basically, this idea of hedonism is whatever comes into your head, do it. If it feels good, do, do it. it. That's it. Feels That's good, it. do it. And unfortunately, you, you got to peel back the layers of the onion just a little bit to understand when you flip the channel over and that televangelist mm. is saying that God just wants you to be happy. Mm. What he's really saying is that whatever come, comes in, just, just do it. It's all about you. It's never been all about me. Ever. It's always been about God. And so Paul is trying to call the people of his time and down the tunnel of time us back to center to get get the north star of our compass realigned to understand that it's high time it's 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 the day of our salvation is closer than when we first believed. now is the time right now to start doing the things that you know need to be done put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh in the history of God's church among the story to past <clears throat> of God's people there hasn't been anyone who has been a more faithful and persuasive spokesman for following the will of the Lord than the Apostle Paul. Paul, yeah. Paul is right at the top. We have seen a similar, except completely dis dissimilar, patron saint of hedonism, John, you brought it up, <laughs> okay. uh, that died just a few years ago in one Hugh Hefner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hugh Hefner lived into his ninth decade. You know, he was chugging toward 100 when he finally just uh, gave up the ghost. Killed over. But think about all of the things that Hugh Hefner advocated and stood for in his life. Yeah. You know, all you women out there, you, you know, you're, you're wonderful creatures. You'd be greater creatures if you lost all your clothes. Hugh was uh, an avatar of that. He was also an avatar of being 90 years old and dating a 19-year-old. I mean that. He liked those silk pajamas, that's for sure. Liked to walk. I mean, don't ever trust the person that's in their pajamas all day. Those of you that are watching this at home, get dressed. Put some clothes on. You can't just walk around in a house coat all the time. So Hef is advocating yeah. this and that and free love and free sex and marriages and outmoded institution. Yeah. You should do this. You should do that. Here's the point. 
Now think about this. For, for, forget about God for just a minute. Let's Don't just do let's that. not now for let, let's put God over here on the back burner, which most of our world is doing anyway. Well, you got a point there. Ask this question from a secular humanist perspective. Okay. How did Hefner's philosophy of hedonism, how is it aged in today's world with believe the women when they're talking about sexual assault and yeah. sexual harassment and woke this and woke that? I mean, if Hefner were alive today, as um, opposed to when he started his magazine. Ironically enough, he'd be in jail. Did you hear? That's my, you brought that, it up. That's my point right there. Some uh, of his bunnies have now uh -huh, turned the page uh -huh. to come out and say, well, it wasn't all moonlight and canoes. Um, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so in the yeah. 50s and 60s and 70s, all oh, he's a free speech advocate. Yeah. He, he's a, an avatar of the new freedom, and, 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 you know, he's talking about being your own man. Yeah. What's, how's that aged? Here's how it's Not aged. Very well. He was a sexual predator. He preyed on young, sometimes underage girls. He took advantage of his, his power and his position. He'd be in jail today. He, he would be. So here's the thing. What Paul is saying to you, <laughs> Its design is not to take away your fun, to make life boring and humdrum. No. Paul is saying, when you're right with God, when you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're making no provision for the flesh, you're going to live a happy, purposeful, contented life. Yeah. Nobody that was close to Hugh Hefner said that the man was satisfied yeah. or content. He wasn't. He was always well, looking for always, the next big yeah, thing. The hamster on the wheel, just chasing that carrot. That's it. And so I think that's a good place to, to bring this to a head. Uh, Paul challenges us to put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, not to make provisions for the flesh and the lust thereof. And I think what the argument ought to be for us is that if you truly want the joy. The Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about happy. I mean, the closest to that is the Beatitudes, blessed, mm -hmm. blessed, right. you know. But but joy is what the Bible speaks of. And if you want to have that joy, something that's deep down and satisfying, mm. something that the world is is notoriously absent of these days, the joy comes in fulfilling um, the the mission that Christ put us here for. That is to live. The life walk the walk as well as talk the talk and i think paul does an excellent job of challenging us hugh hefner didn't have the peace that surpasses all understanding nope. people who live hedonistic lives out for themselves and their own gratification they don't know that no. peace the apostle paul knew it we can know it yeah. you can know it even tonight if you put on the lord jesus christ and make no provision for the flesh you're on your way to living life the way it was supposed to be lived. Absolutely. Let's ask God's blessing as we close. Our Father, we're thankful that you've called us to life on a higher plane, that Jesus has come that he might give us life and give it to us more abundantly. Father, we recognize that our world is receiving screaming messages. Mm -hmm. Just do whatever you want. Don't worry about the will of God. Don't worry about the teachings of Scripture. And Father, that has turned out to be a mess of pottage that has poisoned mm. so many millions and millions of lives. Father, indeed, help us to walk decently as in the daytime. Help us to take advantage of the time because the time is drawing short. Help us to be prepared to meet you. Help us to live the way that you've called us to live. Father, forgive us when we sin, creating us forgiving hearts toward one another. And help us to recognize that the day of salvation is one day closer than the day that we believe. And help us to be ready. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.